My relationship with Pokemon is kind of weird. The first game I ever played in the series was Pokemon Silver version back on a cousin's Game Boy. But as for the Pokemon games I actually played a ton as a kid, well those were Pokemon Stadium 1 and 2 over on a friend's Nintendo 64. And even then a lot of that was just screwing around with mini games. I didn't own an actual Pokemon RPG until I got my own copy of Pokemon Coliseum on the GameCube. And as for handheld games, I wouldn't own one until good old Pokemon Diamond version on the DS. My early memories of the series stem mostly from the stadium games on the N64. But let's be real, those games are kind of weird. Weird and retro. <laughs> you gamers at home hear that? If you didn't, you should... If you didn't, you, you should subscribe and, and stuff like that. Alright, to be serious though, Pokemon has had some pretty weird spin-offs over time. But Pokemon Stadium isn't just weird, it's kind of awesome too. So I'm Trey, and they're Jamie. And this is Retrospective, the series where we push off the rose-tinted glasses to look at games from our past to see how they hold up today. Today's look, Pokemon Stadium, and why it was weird and awesome. The Nintendo 64. What a legendary console. Best known for such classics as Quest 64 and Mahjong Master. And, on August 1st, 1998, Japan was greeted with the first Pokemon Stadium game. Which was completely different from the game the rest of the world got as Pokemon Stadium 1. Here's a bit of context. During this time, the only generation of Pokemon was the first generation of Pokemon, and the world was caught up in a phenomenon known as Pokemania. Thanks to an aggressive marketing campaign, an anime that in hindsight is nostalgically cheesy, and a trading card game, the series had achieved popularity once thought impossible for a video game franchise. Video game franchise is the key word here. For all the successes of all that Poke merch out there, none of this would be possible without Pokemon Red and Blue versions on Game Boy, which were actually originally Pokemon Red and Green versions in Japan. But then like, Game Freak was like, hey, those original games had some really fugly looking Pokemon, let's do a special new Pokemon Blue version that looks a bit less disgusting, but it's basically the same game otherwise. And then they like, smashed red and green and blue versions together and shuffled some things around for the western red and blue versions. At this point in 1998, Pokemon Yellow version wasn't even out yet. And for the uninitiated, that was once again more or less the same damn game as the original red and green versions, but slightly prettier and with some events tweaked to better coincide with the Pokemon anime series. Most notably, this meant you started the game with a Pikachu. But the question on everyone's minds was, when are we finally going to get a fully 3D Pokemon RPG? Nintendo had a pretty beefy 3D capable system out with the Nintendo 64, and it only made sense to put something Pokemon related on the thing. Pokemon was huge after all. Well at one point there was a full on Pokemon RPG planned for the N64. This was a fittingly titled Pokemon 64, and it was planned to take advantage of the Nintendo 64 disk drive, an add-on that let the Nintendo 64 use huge floppy disk-like things and get an extra bit of oomph and power. And like all successful video game systems, it released in 1999 in Japan via mail order with real no indication of a Pokemon RPG in the works at all. So Pokemon 64 was a bust and Nintendo 64 cartridges were not a viable choice for holding games as big as your average RPG of the era. There's a reason Square ditched the N64 early on in Final Fantasy VII's development, and clearly Nintendo was aware of this fatal flaw as well. But, just because a full-on 3D Pokemon adventure wasn't possible, that didn't mean a game centered around 3D Pokemon battles couldn't be done. So here we are back in 1998. You have a Nintendo 64 and are an avid Pokemon fan, and Nintendo just announced a new game centered around 3D Pokemon battles. You can hook up your Game Boy Pokemon game of choice to your N64 via a sweet new transfer pack, 
and you can duke it out in battle with a whopping 42 different Pokemon. And people complained about the Sword and Shield dex cut. Imagine if the only unevolved Pokemon you could use in those games was Pikachu. To be fair, there were models of all 151 original Pokemon in the game, just the majority of them were only available via the Pokedex feature. Also, the later N64 Pokemon Stadium games often got criticized for having many of their features locked behind needing a copy of the Game Boy Pokemon games. But, in this original jaunt, all but one of the game modes is literally locked behind needing a Japanese copy of one of the Gen 1 Pokemon games. At least the Game Boy Tower mode is here? If you want, you can go ahead and play your Game Boy game on the big screen here, which I guess is cool, but the meat of this title is in your regular battle mode. There's three modes here. The first of these is Free Battle, where you can just choose a team of Pokemon to battle against a friend or CPU. Then there's Tournament Modes, which feature cups based off the Nintendo Cup 97 and Nintendo Cup 98, which were real Pokemon tournaments that took place in real life. I think it's really cool to see representation of real-world tournaments in a game like this. But really, even back in the 90s, I think this title was only a decent fit for the most die-hard of Pokemon fans. Don't get us wrong, the game looks and sounds decent enough, but nowadays, thanks to the language barrier, it's only worth owning if you're a Pokemon Mega fan, or a crazy game collector, or a bit of both. Like the type of crazy little shit that'd trade a bunch of Pokemon cards for an Ouya or something. You know, just because I actually did that, it doesn't make me a bad person, right? Yes, hello, 911. I'd like to report a war crime. Clearly, Nintendo and Game Freak realized that this first Pokemon Stadium game was a bit lacking, as only eight months later, Japan would be greeted with Pokemon Stadium 2, which would later come out that same year in North America as just Pokemon Stadium. Stadium 2, or rather, Stadium 1 Worldwide is absolutely the game the first should have been. Sure, there's no tournaments based off of real-world Pokemon tournaments here, but what we got instead is an overall package that has a lot more meat on its bones. Like, damn. Literally all the 151 can actually be used here. What really makes all these battles come alive for me, though, is the addition of an announcer. This guy commentates over every single match, and while I'm sure some may find it annoying, I find it more endearing than anything else. The soundtrack is pretty kick-ass too. From the general battle music, to the gym leader music, to the Mewtwo battle theme, all of it is pretty rad. And you heard that right, there's a gym leader castle mode, where you can fight every single gym leader from Pokemon Red and Blue versions, complete with new teams and gym trainers that actually name their Pokemon. That, that's actually a really cool little touch. And when you beat said gym trainers, the game takes them and their Pokemon out back and gives them the old, old yeller, if, if, if you get what I'm saying, wink, wink, wink. Very nice, Game Freak. Very cool. The tournament mode is now the much improved stadium mode, which divide into four sections referred to in game as cups. First is the Pika Cup, which tasks you with only using Pokemon between levels 15 and 20. Then there's the Petite Cup, which lets you use only non-fully evolved Pokemon between levels 25 and 30. There's also the Poke Cup, where all Pokemon are allowed at their levels, but are limited between levels 50 and 55. This cup and the following Prime Cup are also divided into four difficulty levels as well. And speaking of the Prime Cup, this is the most challenging cup in the game, and anything goes here. As such, all opponents in this cup will have their Pokemon at level 100. If you complete the Gym Leader Castle and Stadium Mode, you'll get a chance to fight the one and only Mewtwo. Defeating Mewtwo will unlock both a Round 2 mode featuring tougher trainers and the ability to have Mewtwo as a rental Pokemon. You heard that right! While you can hook up a copy of Pokemon Red, Blue, or Yellow versions via the transfer pack to your N64, and then transfer in your own Pokemon from those games, there is a variety of rental Pokemon available here that you can use so you aren't solely limited to having to have a Game Boy on hand to fully enjoy this title. I mean, don't get me wrong, for having the best experience, having a transfer pack and a Gen 1 game is still recommended, but these rental Pokemon make a nice addition. Clearly Nintendo felt the same, as Western Stadium 1 originally had a transfer pack bundled in with it. 
And yeah, not all of the rental Pokemon have the best movesets, but if you just want to do some quick battles with a friend or experiment using Pokemon you maybe haven't given a shot yet, or just don't own a transfer pack in a Gen 1 game, then this is a decent way to at least experience what Pokemon Stadium 1 has to offer. Not to mention all the additional stuff is there too. There's all the unlockable bonuses, such as a surfing Pikachu that you can unlock that you can send to your Game Boy games. Oh, and there's a few modes locked behind having a Game Boy, such as Professor Oak's Lab, which has a similar feature to the Pokedex function in the original game, among other things, and returning Game Boy Tower. Meeting certain requirements will actually unlock the Doduo and Dodrio modes for the Game Boy Tower, which allows you to speed up your Game Boy games while you're playing them. Oh, and let me be more specific, your Game Boy Pokemon games. Yeah, for some reason this mode just works with mainline Gen 1 Pokemon games, even though it's a glorified Game Boy emulator. And we can't forget the Kids Club either. Oh hell yeah, the Kids Club. You know how I said I played a ton of this game as a kid? Now this is the mode I remember playing the most. This is a selection of nine different minigames, and while it's certainly no Mario Party, they're definitely pretty fun. If only I didn't suck at literally every single one of them. <laughs> I think the later Pokemon Stadium 2 did this mode a bit better, but some mini-games such as Sushi Go Round and Magikarp Splash are really fun and memorable. Hell, Magikarp Splash would even spawn a mobile game years later. Pokemon Stadium 1 Yankee Doodle Edition is definitely good, but that comment Jamie made on Stadium 2 having a better minigame mode can pretty much apply to everything Stadium 2 did. Now, to avoid confusion, let me clarify something. Stadium 1 Japan would spawn Stadium 2 Japan, which was Stadium 1 International. However, in December 2000, a third Stadium game would see release in Japan, which would become Stadium 2 Internationally after releasing in 2001. Would that game become Pokemon Stadium 3 in Japan then? Nah, just Pokemon Stadium Gold and Silver. Honestly, that Japanese name sums up what Stadium 2 International is which we'll just refer to as Stadium 2 from here on out for the sake of simplicity. Stadium 2 is the same leap in content and quality from the previous two Stadium games that Pokemon Gold and Silver versions were over the first generation games. There are 251 Pokemon available to use here, two different Gym Leader castles, transfer pack support that has expanded to be compatible with Pokemon Gold, Silver, and Crystal versions, and even some very rudimentary online functionality that allowed you to watch save battles over in Japan thanks to the weird Game Boy mobile phone adapter thing that was released exclusively over there. The game world feels so much more fleshed out here too. Instead of taking place in some place in the Kanto region, Stadium 2 takes place in the gorgeous destination of White City. White City is a hell of a place! The two Gym Leader castles feature Gym Leaders from both regions that have been featured in Pokemon up to this point, complete with Old Yellering and their respective Gyms. The Game Boy Tower and Pokemon Lab make a return here too, as does the Stadium Mode and Round 2 option, all of which are mostly the same as before. Well, instead of fighting Mewtwo, you get to fight Pokemon Gen 2 Emo Rival Boy Silver here, but you get the gist of it. But the additional small tweaks really made Stadium 2 shine. The battle arenas are more fleshed out, and the UI just seems cleaner and more modern than in previous games. The battle system has been tweaked to be more in line with gold and silver versions, and the fact that the game came in a literal gold and silver colored cartridge really makes it stand out on a shelf. Or when plugged into a Pikachu themed N64, for example. Also, can we talk about how much I love the Pokemon Academy feature here? This place lets you take place in a variety of test battles where you can learn different strategies and such. Combine this with all of the other raw Pokemon data and documentation contained within this game, and Pokemon Stadium 2 becomes one of the best resources out there for Pokemon fans living in an era where internet access wasn't as widespread as it is today. Again, like in Stadium 1 JP, an international, Stadium 2 can only be fully enjoyed with a transfer pack and Game Boy Pokemon game on hand. And trust me, even though the rental Pokemon seem a bit better than in the previous games, there's no denying that that's still the case here. But for a hardcore Pokemon fan living in the year 2001, this game is absolutely a must own. Just because of the raw amount of polish and features here. Besides, it's a pretty damn good party game too. They really outdid themselves with the expanded Kids Club in this one. 
The mini games here are all original, and there's 12 in Stadium 2 compared to just 9 in Stadium 1. I legitimately fondly remember all of these, with Eager Eevee and that one cut the rope style one being my favorites. No joke, if I'm having friends over and want an easy party game for us to play, I sometimes will just bust out the N64 in Stadium 2 because of how dang fun some of these mini games are even as adults. And please don't mind these graphical glitches. Uh, for anyone watching from Nintendo, don't worry, this is all being played on legit software, right Jamie? Sorry, what's that? I couldn't hear you over salty comments about why we're not covering Pokemon Coliseum and XD on the GameCube, even though I consider those to be their own thing. Pokemon Stadium 2 is a really great game for any Pokemon fan, but we'd argue it wasn't the last of the Stadium games. In 2006, Pokemon Battle Revolution would see release on the Nintendo Wii. Developed by Genius Sonority, the same folks behind Pokemon Coliseum and XD Gale of Darkness on the GameCube, this seemed like another old-school Stadium game, but made with the Pokemon Diamond and Pearl generation in mind. I mean... That's... Sort of what we got? Let me be clear. I know a lot of folks love Battle Revolution. I also know that a lot of folks hate it. And I know a lot of folks are especially going to hate my opinion on it, so let me get this out of the way right now. In my personal opinion, Pokemon Battle Revolution is the best tech demo for the Wii. Set on the gorgeous island of Poketopia, this Gen 4 based stadium game features you going through a variety of different stadiums and maybe battling with friends, and that's... yeah, that's about it. There's a lot of character customization, some of the stadiums, uh, I mean coliseums, are pretty neat, such as that one where you have your Pokemon selected by a roulette wheel. But to a degree not seen since the original Japanese Pokemon Stadium game, you absolutely need a DS and a Gen 4 Pokemon game to get the full experience here. Character customization? Locked behind having a game connected. Prizes? Locked behind having a game connected. One of the stadiums? Locked behind having a game connected. Hell, you can't even use most of the 493 Pokemon from Gen 4 without having a game connected. They somehow managed to screw up rental Pokemon here. Instead of having a list of rental Pokemon you can choose from before each stadium challenge, you have rental passes, which have preset characters with six pre-selected Pokemon. Completing certain in-game criteria will unlock more passes, but for the first several hours of the game, unless you connect a copy of Pokemon Diamond, Pearl, Platinum, Heart Gold, or Soul Silver, you will have a grand total of 12 different Pokemon you can use. And if you get bored, well, there's no mini games, no Game Boy Tower esque mode you can play to take your mind off things. There's just battles and battles and battles and battles and battles and battles and battles. It gets kind of stale after a while, and I mean, sure, there used to be an online battle mode, but even when the Wii's online features still worked, this mode was finicky at best. <laughs> But, this is where my statement about Battle Revolution being one of the Wii's best tech demos comes in. For as lean as this game is on, well, gameplay, it has to be one of the best looking and sounding games on the Wii. God, the soundtrack here is full of jams. From Gateway Coliseum, to Stargaze Coliseum, to even freaking Wi-Fi menu theme, the music is incredible. There's even an announcer again, but this time it's the same guy who voiced the narrator in the Pokemon anime. That's how you know PBR ain't fucking around. And those graphics! Oh goodness, those graphics! Especially when upscaled to 4K through <clears throat> legitimate means, this game is easily the best looking that any Pokemon game has ever been. The Pokemon are all so lively in how they're animated. Several attacks have multiple animations showcasing them from different angles, and a lot of the coliseums are filled to the brim with impressive lighting effects. It's a graphical showcase of what the Wii could really do, and it's also a prime example of why so many longtime Pokemon fans were disappointed by a lot of the more static Pokemon animations in Pokemon Sword and Shield on the Switch. Sure, Unlike Sword and Shield, this isn't a full Pokemon adventure, but PBR does more than just have Pokemon battles. It brings Pokemon to life through battles. And I think Trey agrees with me here too. Oh, absolutely. Is PBR a great game? No. 
Of all the Stadium games, both Jamie and I agree that Stadium 2 is by far the best game, but as a technical showcase of what the Wii is capable of, and as an example of a Pokemon game with battles that can be a blast to watch in short bursts, it's incredible. I traded in a bunch of games to a GameStop to get a copy of PBR at launch as a kid. And I was disappointed. There's definitely not $50 USD worth of content here. It's not nearly as good as Stadium 1 or 2 on the N64, but as an adult, I think it's definitely earned its place in the series. The Pokemon Stadium series is kind of weird, but also they're kind of awesome. Back in the day, just the novelty of seeing Pokemon battle in 3D was enough to sell a lot of folks on Stadium 1 and 2. And sure, every mainline Pokemon game since 2013 has provided that experience, but this is still a subset of games that we think is well worth remembering. So with that, that's it for this episode of Retrospective. I really enjoyed getting to look back on the Pokemon Stadium games, and none of this would have been possible without Trey, both because his input is awesome, and also because I hired him to edit this. Hey guys, how's it going? Uh, I just am editing the video that you're watching right now, and uh, it says in the script that I'm supposed to shamelessly plug uh, my channels and stuff, so... Uh, I'm working on a on a video for my main channel soon, kind of doing a relaunch there. Uh, getting back to doing some reviews of movies on the main channel if you want to check out that. Otherwise, I have a second channel as well that I've just started. Uh, we're going to be posting a lot of funny videos on there as well, uh, hopefully. And uh, other than that, you can follow me on Twitter. I'm funny on Twitter sometimes. Sometimes I make a couple jokes. You know, post a funny picture or a good meme, and, uh, yeah, that's about it. Other than my socials, uh, I'm just kind of, I'm excited to start editing the retrospective series on this channel. Uh, Pokemon I, is, like, my favorite game series, so I'm glad that I got to start, uh, not only starring in one, which was kind of a bucket list thing for me for, for a couple years, and, uh, I got to edit it as well, so I've, I'm not only starring, I'm editing in this, this major production here. So, uh, just big thanks all around, and I hope that you enjoyed uh, today's video. So, uh, yeah, have a great day, uh, or night, or whatever day time of day it is that you're watching this. Uh, bye! On that note, I'm Jamie, and this video was made possible in part by our patrons on Patreon and our YouTube channel members, whose names you're seeing on screen right now. Their support means the world, and every dollar pledge towards the channel only helps us grow. I'd also like to quickly plug my new podcast, Speedrun, where we talk about gaming topics in 10 to 15 minutes per episode. New episodes are out every Friday, so definitely check it out on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Podbean, and really any other major podcast app that you like to use. And of course, don't forget to subscribe to Stuff We Play for more great content like this. So with that, thank you very much for watching. Stay classy and I'll see you next time.